Well, good morning, everyone. It is so good to be back again to bring the word of God for all of us today. Wherever you are tuning in from, wherever you're listening from or watching us today, I hope that you are well. And I'm so excited. I have a message on my heart to share uh, with all of us today. And uh, if you like taking notes, the title of today's message is The Gospel of No Worries. We're continuing on in our Sermon on the Mount series, and today we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. And you know me, I love my scripture. So if you have your Bibles with you, could you please take them out and uh, let's read and come into the Word of God together this morning. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. It says this, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. Lord, we're just so thankful that we can come into your word this morning together as a family, as a church. And Lord, I believe that today you want to speak to us that you have truths to reveal to us, that there are things in our hearts that you are going to open up, oh God. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come and speak to us? We open our hearts, our spiritual eyes, our spiritual ears. Lord, we love you. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, Amen. Uh, you know, the gospel of no worries. I grew up with my fair share of watching Disney movies. And if you are a Disney fan, I think you will know where I'm going with this. Pastor Josh, I'm looking at you. Uh, and in 1994, Disney released the equal parts enduring and heartbreaking The Lion King, a Disney classic that revolves around a young lion named Simba who must rise to power after the loss of his father, Mufasa. Now in the movie, Young Simba, he runs away from the Pride Lands, he runs away from his home, and eventually he ends up in the desert where he is rescued by a meerkat and warthog named Timon and Pumbaa. Simba, he grows up with Timon and Pumbaa in their oasis uh, under their motto or their philosophy, Hakuna Matata, which according to Timon and Pumbaa, it means no worries for the rest of your days. It's a problem-free philosophy Hakuna Matata. I'm not going to sing it because if I sing it, that's the only thing you will remember out of today's sermon. Uh, you know, and I don't know whether it's the catchy tune of the song or the fact that it was sung by the uh, comic relief in the movie, but I guarantee you that if you have children who have watched The Lion King before, that this uh, will be one of the most remembered songs or phrases that they will take away. And it has been nearly three decades since the release of the movie, and I still remember the song. And I wonder if part of its appeal is that we all want to live lives that are free from worry. We all want to be free from anxiety. The good news is that Jesus actually wants the same for us. And that's why this message is entitled, The Gospel of No Worries. 
But we do need to make sure that we are living according to Jesus's teachings, Jesus's commandments, and not by other standards, and especially not the standards of a mere cat and a warthog. Now, we've been in this Sermon on the Mount series for a few weeks now, and we know that in this sermon, arguably the greatest sermon that Jesus ever preached, that he is speaking not to the general masses, but he's really speaking to people who are following him. And all throughout the sermon, Jesus is making the point that those who follow him should live differently. And so he lays down truths that will give us a better way to live. Now, in this portion on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus essentially has one point to get across, and it is this. Do not worry. Do not worry. And in fact, if we look at the original text, this can be translated uh, as if to stop an action that is already going ongoing. And so it's like this. If you are not worried, don't start. If you are worrying... Stop it. You need to rein it in. You need to think differently than how you are thinking now. Why? Because Jesus has a better way for us to live. And in these 10 verses, Jesus talks about how his followers should respond to worry. Now, I think that today we have a lot of worries. I think that in the past uh, year and a half, you know, COVID has changed everything about the way that we live. Maybe today we are worrying about our families we're worrying about our finances, our friendships, our relationships. We're worried about putting food on the table. We're worried about paying the bills. If you're a student listening to this today, I am sure you were worried about your studies and your exams. And for all of us, I believe we are left, you know, considering, wondering, and, and worrying about what the future is going to look like. There is a lot of opportunity to be worried these days. But I also want to say something about the context in which Jesus is preaching this sermon. You see, when Jesus says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, drink, or wear, you know, honestly, this might not make much sense to us. Uh, most of us, perhaps at least until recently, never had to worry about what we're going to eat, uh, what we're going to drink. At most, we wonder what we're going to eat. Uh, we never really worry about what we're going to wear. At most, our concern is, does this look good on me today? Uh, because we have options. And if it doesn't look good, we go to our closet and we change. And so we deal with this, uh, this verse or what Jesus says differently. But in those days, Jesus was speaking to a group of people that wrestled with survival daily. And as a population, they were under siege by the Romans. They were taxed heavily. The economy was one uh, where people were hired and fired on any given day. And often they were hired for the day and they would be paid at the end of the day. If you think back to last week's sermon, Matthew 20, the parable of the workers in the, in the vineyard. And so this kind of system, it left people with, um, you know, not much opportunity to save. Uh, and so there was a great temptation to worry about tomorrow. And so these people, Jesus is speaking to them. They were preoccupied with, you know, literally, will they get another meal? If their clothing tore, would they get to wear something else? Uh, because often all that they had was on their back. Uh, think of the disciples who left everything behind to follow Jesus. They had left their nets behind. They had no direct income. They weren't sure where their next meal was going to come from because who knew where Jesus was going to go next? And if they did have food, what if they had to share it with 5,000 people? And so Jesus was speaking into a culture that would give you many, many reasons to worry. And yet he says to them, do not worry. And in these 10 verses, Jesus says these, uh, this phrase, do not worry three times, almost as if he hardly wants to give people an opportunity to worry. I think we need to be clear about a few things, you know. Uh, we need to be clear that Jesus's gospel of no worries is not Hakuna Matara. Uh, Jesus is not advocating a life without responsibilities. Jesus is not advocating a life without forethought or planning. What he is condemning is anxious and worrisome forethought. Um, I think it's important that we know being prudent about our future is right, but self-tormenting anxiety is not. And Jesus is also not advocating life without work. Um, and this portion of the Sermon on the Mount is not so we can just justify sitting around idly twiddling our thumbs. 
This portion of the Sermon of the Mount, this passage also doesn't mean that we do not have to care for our neighbor. Just because God provides providentially for the needs of his children uh, does not free us from the responsibility of being the means by which he does it. And I also want to draw a distinction between good worry and bad worry. I think this is important because there is a place for anxiety and concern of the good type. Think of 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, where Paul says, besides other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. And the word concern there is the same word as worry in Matthew chapter 6. There is a level of concern that everybody should have. As a parent, there is a healthy level of concern that you should have for your children. As an employee, you should have some concern about uh, uh, over, over what your boss thinks uh, about your job performance because that concern will help you identify what areas you need to improve or grow in. And that is all good worry, right? But Jesus here is talking about a bad worry that leads to anxiety, that leads to unproductivity, that leads to futility. And I want to suggest that there are four ways that we can see perhaps when our good worry has gone bad. Firstly, bad worry is always marked by distraction. You know, the Greek for the word carries this meaning of a divided mind, an inability to focus because your mind is divided, because your mind is distracted. And so worry at its worst leads to distraction. So if you have something that is constantly distracting you, something that you just cannot get your mind off, something you cannot leave with God, and that's usually a sign that you have a bad worry. Secondly, a bad worry is often marked by a diminished trust in God. And what ends up happening is that because we cannot trust God, we put too much on ourselves, we burden ourselves, we are constantly trying to become our own savior. And so that is a sign of bad worry. Here's the third thing about bad worry. Bad worry has us living too much in the future to the point where we drag the future into the present. Hear me again. Jesus is not saying do not plan. What he's saying is do not worry about tomorrow. Don't bring future worries into today. And so when we are overloading ourselves with issues and worries from the future that we have no control over, that is a bad worry. And here's the last thing about bad worry. Bad worry leads to inaction. Bad worry, it is fruitless. It is futile. In fact, Jesus says in verse 27, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Bad worry adds nothing to our life, nothing good to our life. You know, it will probably add stress and ulcers and migraines and hypertension, but it is not going to add anything good to our lives. In fact, bad worry very often leads to paralysis and inability to take action. And we will know when we have a bad worry because all we do is talk and talk and rant and rant about our worry, but we are not actually doing anything about it. That is worry gone bad. And so the rule is clear. The rule is do not worry. Verse 25, verse 31, and verse 34. In fact, in the Amplified, uh, it puts it this way. Therefore, I tell you, stop being worried or anxious. Stop being perpetually uneasy and distracted. And the truth is, whatever Jesus says to us should be enough for us to obey. But he knows us so well and he knows that in our hearts, in our minds, we're saying, okay, you're saying do not worry, but I have so many things to be worried about. Why shouldn't I worry? And Jesus gives us a couple of reasons why we should not worry. By doing so, Jesus is inviting us into his heart, into his mind. It's a wonderful opportunity. So here's the first reason. Do not worry because God is your master. Verse 25, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? You now every time we see the word therefore, we are to look and see and ask, what is it therefore? Therefore means that we are talking about something that is a continuation from something earlier, from an earlier thought. And so if you joined us last week, you will know that in verse 24, it says this, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. 
And so last week, we talked about treasures being a place where we get a sense of well-being, a sense of identity, a sense of hope, a sense of satisfaction. And we drew a distinction between two treasures, two ways of seeing, and two masters. And so what is Jesus saying at this point? He's saying to us, if we have got our treasure right, if the way our eye is seeing is right, and if we are serving the right master, then we are not to worry. Now, here's the thing about this, right? If God is to be our master, then we are to be his servants. And if God is really our master, then actually whatever Jesus says, we should trust, follow, and obey without delay, without question. But there's so much more to this analogy that I want to unpack this morning. Uh, and, you know, we need to understand that the master-slave terminology is frequent throughout the Bible because the master-slave relationship was very common uh, in the first century. Uh, it was, however, very, very different to the evil days of the 18th and 19th century um, slave trade or modern-day human trafficking, uh, where, you know, you had no rights, you were a slave for life, there was no such thing as family or protection, and you were regarded as a subhuman commodity for trade. As a slave in the first century, you were actually part of the extended family. You had certain rights, such as rights to freedom after a certain number of years if the master agreed, but the slave could also choose to stay. You had rights to marriage after a certain amount of time, and your children could work in the master's household. The master was responsible for, the, for protecting the slave long term or for life. And all this meant that your master had total responsibility over every need you ever had. If a slave needed clothes, the master would provide that. If the slave needed food and drink, it was the responsibility of the master to provide that for the slave and his family. Whatever you needed, the master is supposed to take care of. And so if you are a first century, first century servant, the fact that you had a master was comforting because everything that you needed was provided for. So what is Jesus trying to tell his followers? Jesus is making the point that when God is your master, being part of God's household as a slave is a privilege. It is a privilege because God is the most loving, the most protecting, uh, the most providing, the most caring, the most rewarding master that we can ever have. In the Anglican tradition, they put it this way, serving God as our master is complete freedom. This is also why the Apostle Paul gladly calls himself a doulos, a willing bond slave of Jesus in his epistles. There is a story told about how one day a man came up running to John Wesley, the evangelist, and that man came in a panic saying, your house has burned down. And John Wesley said, no, it hasn't. And the man said, yes, it has. And John Wesley said, no, it hasn't because I don't own a house. The one that I have been living in belongs to the Lord. And if it has burned down, then that is one less responsibility for me to worry about. That is a perspective of freedom. Now, I don't have that perspective, but I know I need it. When God is our master, we can live with this kind of freedom. Jesus is saying, do not worry because God is your master. God will provide for you. God is, is in control of everything. We say that glibly, but he owns this world. You know, God, uh, he, the winds and the waves obey Jesus. There is nothing in nature that is out of God's control, even viruses. God is absolutely in control. God has got this. We may not know what the plan is or why, uh, but God has got this and we are going to get through this. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and all who dwell within. Psalm 24, 1, you see God owns us by creation and he owns us by redemption. And will not God who gave us life also provide all the things that we need in life, be it food, drink or clothing. So do not worry because God is your master. Here's the second reason Jesus gives uh, us. Do not worry because God is your father. You see, I love that Jesus, he doesn't just stop at God being our master, although it is true. 
But Jesus, he goes one step further and he says that we are not to worry because not only is God our master, but even better, he is our father. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to use a little of your imagination with me this morning, uh, but you know, let's, let's think uh, uh, if, if we were sitting down listening to Jesus preach uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I think it is entirely possible that as Jesus was saying this, that a flock of birds flew overhead. And he says this, right? He says, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? I want us to notice the language that is used here. Jesus doesn't say their heavenly father. He doesn't say their heavenly father feeds them. God is their heavenly creator, but there's no personal relationship. God is not their heavenly father. God is not the heavenly father of the birds. See, God doesn't promise to birds what he promises to us. So he is our heavenly father more than just our creator. I don't know if any of you are keen bird watchers, but uh, recently I watched this documentary about all these rare birds and there were some of the most incredibly beautiful creatures I had ever seen in my life. And it's true, you know, birds, they, they just go about their life. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns. You know, they, they're just singing and soaring and they are at the complete mercy of their creator, your heavenly father. You see, no bird was ever created in the image of God. No bird was ever promised an eternity forever in heaven. God is your heavenly father. And maybe it's because they were sitting on a grassy hill with flowers, but then Jesus uses other things in creation to get his point across. He says, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass on the field, which is which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh you, of little faith? What is Jesus trying to get across? This is what he's saying. He's saying that the same God who providentially cares for his creation, these transitory creatures like birds, these temporary things like lilies and grass, are you not worth more to him than these things? The answer is yes, you absolutely are. And so Jesus is saying, if you have God as your heavenly father, there is no room for worry. You see, when we know that we have a good master who is in control of whatever situation we are in, if we know we have a heavenly father who providentially cares for his creation, when we know these things and yet we are still given over to worry, Jesus says that that is an indicator of unbelief. And he uses two things to convey this. Firstly, Jesus uses these words, O you of little faith, verse 30. And secondly, he refers to the Gentiles, verse 32, or basically he's saying heathens, unbelievers. You see, our worry advertises that we do not trust God as our master or as our father. Worry is saying, mm, yeah, I think, you know, this situation is really bad. I don't think God has got this. Yes, he has. He has. Worry, worry advertises that we do not trust that God is going to take care of us. Yes, he is. He promised he would. And if you really think about it, worry is a practical atheism. And practical atheism is saying that you believe in Jesus, that you believe in God, but you act like you do not have a heavenly father. You act as though God is not faithful, God is not kind, and God is not committed to looking after you. And I know that this is hard to hear, but when we know who God is and yet we still give ourselves over to bad worrying, it is wrong. It is wrong because bad worrying has us undervaluing who we are to God and our relationship with him. We are his children. We are the apple of his eye. We are special to him. Then why would he not take care of us? 
please hear my heart. I'm not here to make trivial or to make light of the challenges that we go through that I know bring us worry and bring us anxiety. I'm not here to trivialize that, but I am here to make much of who Jesus is and who he says God is to us. God is our master and God is our heavenly father and God can be trusted to take care of us. So what is the gospel of no worries? We've talked about the rule, which is do not worry. We've also talked about the reasons because God is your good master. And even better, he is your heavenly father. God is not just interested in providing for you, but he wants a relationship with you. And so the gospel, the good news or the good story about no worries, I believe is found in verse 33. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. What are these things? See, Jesus is referring to the material concerns of life, what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear. In other words, Jesus is saying this, that you put the priority on seeking me and my kingdom, and I will relieve you of this worry over material things. I will take care of you. Jesus is telling us to put a priority on the kingdom of God. Some of us, whenever we hear that, you know, we actually become even more worried and more stressed because, you know, we're saying, oh my goodness, I have, I already, already have all these responsibilities. I'm trying to be a good parent. I'm trying to be a good boss. I'm trying to be a good daughter. I'm just, you know, I have all these things to do. And now Jesus, you want to add onto my plate? No, we misunderstand. Because seeking God's kingdom is not adding another priority to our life. It's something that we let affect every priority of our life. It means that at every point in my life, I will view things in light of what it will do to expand the kingdom of God and reflect his righteousness. You know, for example, if I say that I want to be a godly daughter or I want to be a good boss to my employees, you know, this is not something that I do in addition to seeking the kingdom of God. It is really by doing those things in a godly manner. That is a way that I seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I let that overarch and encompass everything that I do in my life. I go to a Zoom meeting at nine o'clock on a Monday morning. God, I want to seek your kingdom when I am at work today. I go to school. I say, God, I want to seek your kingdom when I am at school today. It is something that overarches everything in our lives. And so seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness means that the most important issue in every decision that I make and in everything that I do is this. It is determining God's perspective. And I need to ask God these questions. God, what do you want me to do? God, what is most pleasing to you? God, what will best reflect your righteousness? And we can ask these questions in every sphere of our lives. God, what do you want me? What do you want me to do in my workplace? God, what is most pleasing to you uh, that I can do in my family? God, what will best reflect your righteousness in my neighborhood, in my community? And the answers to these questions will determine our actions. Finally, we're going to come to a close. Jesus says this, verse 34, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know, I actually imagine Jesus saying this with a, you know, with a lighthearted smile, with a sense of humor. Because think about it. Can tomorrow actually worry about itself? It's kind of just silly, but I love how real Jesus is. 
He's told us that we do not need to worry. He has given us the gospel of no worries. We all have trouble in life. We will all have trouble in life. And Jesus just wants to make sure that we are dealing with it properly. Don't live through your troubles twice. First, when you worry about it, and then a second time when you actually go through it. Why add tomorrow's trouble to today? God doesn't promise a trouble-free life, but he does offer us a worry-free life. Plan for the future, but don't worry about the future. There is no sense in worrying about the future because you cannot get to tomorrow without first living through today. See, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It only robs today of its strength. Don't cripple the present by worrying about the future. Leave tomorrow in God's hands and all that you need for today, God will provide because he is your good master. He is your heavenly father. You know, every time the word of God goes out, we have an opportunity to respond to Jesus. And today I believe that he is saying to us to cast all our cares, all our worries, all our anxieties upon Jesus. Why? Because he cares for us. For some of us, you know that you have been holding on to some worries far longer than you should. For some of us, we're not only bringing the worries of the future into today, we're also bringing in regrets from the past and we are overburdening ourselves with worry. God says, do not worry. He says, do you not see who I am and who you are to me? Friend, will you turn your eyes to Jesus? Will you take them off your worries and your anxieties and fix them upon Jesus? See God for who he says he is. He is the most loving, the most protecting, the most providing master we could ever have. He is the best heavenly father we will ever know. And so right now, wherever you are, I ask that you just open up your hands, lift them to God, and let's pray this morning. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that whenever we come into your word, you are always speaking into our hearts. I thank you, Lord, for showing us what worries we have allowed to consume our lives. And I thank you, God, for reminding us that we do not have to worry. Today, God, we cast all our cares, all our worries, all our anxieties onto you. Forgive us, Lord, for saying that we believe in you and yet we live with all of our worries as if to deny you of your goodness, of your faithfulness, of your kindness towards us. Help us to see who you are for who you say you are. Thank you that because you are our master and our father, that we do not need to worry. Help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Help us to always ask you first, God, what do you want me to do? God, what is most pleasing to you? And God, what will best reflect your righteousness? Right now, we break that spirit of worry and the spirit of self-tormenting anxiety over our lives in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask that you would cleanse our hearts daily, that you would lead us in your everlasting ways. We say we love you, Jesus. We want to trust you more. Holy Spirit, help us. We pray this in your most powerful and precious name. And everybody says, Amen. 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 Hey, you know what? Just one last thing before I hand over to the team. You know, friend, uh, maybe you've joined us today and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you know that you have backslided. Uh, and, and, and you know what? T today, God is calling you home. And so we just want to give you an opportunity to respond to him in a very personal way. 
Maybe you've been carrying the burden of living life on your own and living life on your own terms and you're in this place with all these worries and burdens and anxieties that you do not even know if life is still worth it. Friend, I want to encourage you today that there is a God who loves you. There is a God who cares about you. And this is the God who gave his very best just for you. He gave his son Jesus to die a lonely death on the cross so that you and I could have life, not just eternal life, but new life and hope in here and now. This is the same God who says to us that when we put our trust in him, that we do not need to live with worry and anxiety over anything. So friend, would you today respond to Jesus by opening your heart and receiving Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior? And if that is you today, I would just love to lead you in a short prayer to receive Jesus into your heart. Won't you pray this with me today? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe Jesus is your son and that he died on the cross to take away my sins and that he rose from the grave to give me eternal life. Today, I turn from my old way of living life and I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord, as my Savior, as my Master, as my Father, as my best friend. Thank you for giving me new life, new hope, and a new future in you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Hey, you know what, friend, if you pray that prayer today, we would just love to connect with you to see how we can help you along in this journey. So make sure you stick around. There'll be some uh, guidelines on how you can do that. But otherwise, all of you, you know, we love you. We're thinking about you. We're praying for you. You are so precious to God. You are so treasured by God. Don't you ever forget it. Take care, everybody, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you, Pastor H. Thank you so much for reminding us not to worry and reminding us about who God is and how He loves and cares for us. And that's why we can trust Him. If you have said the prayer with Pastor H earlier, um, scan this QR code. Let us know. Let us connect with you because we would love to journey with you. We would love to walk into this whole new journey, this whole new unknown together with you. So let us know and just scan the QR code because there's so much more that we have for you that we want to help you with on this new journey.